Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I want to welcome you to this webinar presentation on closing the skills gap in your digital supply chain design, presented by Mibok and Coupa. Before we get started, one quick housekeeping note. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of your questions at the end as time permits. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the companies that will be featured in today's presentation. Coupa Supply Chain Design and Planning, formerly Lamasop, has identified $16 billion in value in supply chain savings. 70% of the Fortune 500 with physical supply chains rely on Coupa's solutions. All five masters and 19 of Gartner's supply chain top 25 make their decisions with Coupa technology and has been used by more than 3,000 supply chain analytics initiatives with the largest enterprises. We'll also be hearing from Mibok Consulting, a globally recognized supply chain consulting, engineering, and advisory firm supporting clients by designing strategies, developing cost-effective concepts, determining IT solutions and technical equipment down to the last detail, and implementing the solutions in order to deliver step change improvements and innovation strategically, tactically, and digitally. And Eaton Corporation is a multinational electrical and industrial power management company with business sectors in electrical products, vehicle components, aerospace, and e-mobility. So, something about our speakers today. Matt Tishon is Vice President of Industry Strategy at Coupa. He has 25 years of experience leading supply chain projects and building teams at organizations such as Arby's, Clarion Corporation, and Oracle. He was VP of Industry Strategy at Lamasov, and he currently leads the supply chain industry strategy at Coupa. Victoria Ma is Digitalization Lead for North America at Mibok Consulting. Victoria has spent the last decade designing and supporting supply chain networks for well-known companies such as AB InBev, Mondelez, L'Oreal, and Estee Lauder. In her current role, she helps Mibok clients to identify where data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence can come together, either inside an existing platform or with a custom application to provide strategic, operational, and executional improvements to supply chains. And Marielle Cage is global lead for supply chain design, analytics, and TCO at Eaton Corporation. Marielle has been with Eaton for over 14 years, supporting multiple business units during her career, both in Europe and North America, with transportation, procurement, distribution, and strategic supply chain initiatives. And so with that, I want to turn it over to Matt Tishon of Coupa. Matt, take it away. Thanks, Bob, for those introductions. Um, for audience, I do want to make one mention. Everything has been changing with supply chain, right? What that's one thing that we can count on is is supply chain is is definitely changing into it to expect the unexpected. Uh, the same is going to be true today, as Marielle from Eaton had a last minute uh, crisis, so she can't join us today. So it's almost appropriate that we're talking about supply chain change and the world of supply chain is changing. And that's even holding true with, with presentations on supply chain today, those change as well. But we've checked this presentation, we checked it for resiliency, and I think we're still gonna do a fantastic, fantastic job today. So sorry about that last minute uh, change, and we hope everything is as well with Marielle and her, uh, her situation. So let's talk about um, today's session. So first of all, um, just welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and we're going to be talking about, you know, the skills gap, really project initiation. Uh, we're going to touch on that. How do you initiate a project with an organization? We're going to talk about skills development and the sessions I've attended at multiple conferences. Skills development is always a crowd pleaser. There's always great attendance on that because the supply chain skill gap is real and we, we need more people and skilled people in this. And then finally, we're going to walk through a maturity model um, for that, uh, call it a supply chain center of excellence, and then launching that Q&A that Bob talked about. So please um, keep with us for that Q&A and, and bring your questions. So project initiation is the first area we're going to touch on in this. And we're going to start this today with the polling questions. We want to involve the audience today and, and bring up this first polling question. So related to project initiation, which statement best describes your current organization's 
uh, structure around supply chain design competency? Is it ad hoc request with no designated organization? Do you have a couple people in spreadsheets that they're using for this? Have you have standardized applications, maybe within the lines of businesses, or maybe even a shared service model um, where, it's a, where it's shared across multiple lines of business? Maybe even have a center of excellence. Maybe you already have a supply chain center of excellence or wait, am I even on the right webinar? So just take a few minutes and, and, and then we're gonna unpack kind of the results of the audience and, and reflect on, on where everybody's at today within their organization. Great, so bring up the results. Um, so me and Victoria are gonna walk through this again. So we see, um, not necessarily surprising, a couple people in spreadsheets definitely see that as, as an approach as organizations start looking at design um, and understand they need analytics, right? We need to make data-driven decisions and spreadsheets are ubiquitous. Almost every supply chain practitioner, logistics practitioner understands a spreadsheet, has access to it, it's flexible um, and you can purpose repurpose that for a lot of things. Um, Obviously, as complexity grows, uh, you outgrow your spreadsheets. Um, standardized applications with the line of the business coming in at 11%. Um, shared service model, it's great to see that across lines of businesses, 18% of you have adopted that, that shared services model. Um, and even the center of excellence, seeing that at 14% um, is, is a little higher than I expected. So it's great to see that that's, that shared center of excellence is, is gaining some, some traction there. And I did skip over the first one. So ad hoc request with no designated um, organization. And actually that's leading even that supply chain center excellence. So I think we're right on the money here talking about this and wait, am I in the right webinar? For the 9% of you who answered, am I on the right webinar? We're glad you joined the wrong one. We're gonna make this interesting and, and you'll surely learn a few things about supply chain as, as we go through this today. So let's talk about taking that first step um, on your project path. Really the first thing is to align with an executive sponsor. And there's really two, two ways that I've seen transformation for supply chain happen. A couple of ways, um, one is bottom up. There's some, some interest in the organization. Some people understand that the state of what's possible, they do some um, bottom up influence, but ultimately that's gonna come top down. So you have a top level executive who says, hey, we need to make some changes with our supply chain. Our supply chain is not as relevant as it used to be for our current operating condition because things are changing. Um, or you have an executive who comes in from an outside organization who's been there and done that. They've been through this cycle with tools and processes. They've done a lot of supply chain design work. They come into another organization. They say, hey, we got a lot of these challenges and I've already fixed these before in another organization. Um, and let's try to adopt these uh, techniques, uh, technology and processes here and try to get you know, similar results to help alleviate some of these supply chain challenges we have. And the nice thing is when it comes top down, you already have de facto alignment with an executive sponsor. So aligning with that executive sponsor and keeping relevant uh, is definitely, definitely order of the day. Then you need to determine the technology. So this would, would, would be and people to support your vision. So technology, going back to the poll we just answered, is it gonna be spreadsheets? Maybe, maybe there's a couple uh, analysis you can do with spreadsheets. You know, maybe if you've got a couple distri distribution facilities and you're trying to do some customer assignments, maybe you can do that in a spreadsheet. As you get more complex problems and you start to involve uh, manufacturing facilities or suppliers, you may very quickly outgrow those spreadsheets and you have a need for some technology and applications um, and you can investigate that and also the people to explore it. And then forming, form a core steering committee, I think is crucial. So this isn't the project team, but this is gonna be your steering committee. And I, I would recommend taking a cross-functional uh, slice of the business. So people who are um, in finance, people are in supply chain, people who have been in multiple roles in the company, and they're not just focused on one silo, but they've seen it from many different angles. And they've been with the company for 10, 15 years. They really understand the pulse of things because that steering committee is gonna have some history, some tribal knowledge, um, the life cycle of the company, they're gonna understand some of those challenges. And the nice thing about doing this from a, a cross-functional team is when you start to impact change, that change is going to go across silos in your supply chain. It's gonna to touch on manufacturing, it's gonna to touch on distribution, probably transportation, logistics, warehousing, and having those core key um, steering committee members 
upfront, involved and engaged, they can set the pace for hay to their teams. There's going to be some change coming. Um, and that education to the organization is, is crucial. So that steering committee getting on board, having some input, and then going back to their respective um, organizations and helping them understand what's coming is crucial uh, for acceptance and, and adoptance of some of these changes that are going to come out of these modeling efforts. And then finally, it, it's crucial to determine the, the first questions that you'd like to explore. There's going to be a laundry list. As you ideate with your team members, as you ideate with your steering committee, you may have, and I'm sure you, most of you do, some top level down um, KPIs you're trying to hit, whether it's related to carbon emissions, whether it's related to um, bringing costs out of the supply chain, whether it's related to increasing your fill levels. Those key strategic initiatives um, coming from the C-suite are really going to design guide and help you prioritize some of those first questions that you'd like to explore. Um, and then really ranking those questions and um, getting to the point where, again, looking at a question that's probably not in one silo of supply chain, but something that expands multiple silos, maybe warehousing and transportation or warehousing and manufacturing to start the organizational change around systems theory thinking. So um, any, any change you may make in a supply chain is going to have upstream and downstream uh, implications. So it, it's nice to start with one of those projects um, and, and secure that first win. And then moving on to our next side, you know, Vic, um, this slide I think would be a great one for you to cover. Can you help us understand kind of the, these business challenges and the technology as you see them from your point of view as you help customers uh, of Mibok along in their journey? Yeah, I'd like to also talk about, because um, you mentioned that uh, the first step is really get buyings from uh, executives, right? Mm -hmm. But for us, especially for the 9%, we're, we're not sure if you're in the right webinar, where do sure. we start, right? How do we get buyings and what's our story to tell to even form that project initiation? And our answer or suggestion here is really to look at what business challenges you're having today. Even if the, the concept of supply chain design hasn't even come up yet, but be aware of what's happening in the business. Are we having expansion of growth? Are we acquiring other companies that we don't know even how to manage the supply chain? Are there business model changes that we're not equipped with our assets for the future requirements? Are there KPI issues, as you mentioned, Matt, Matt? And by realizing those business challenges, we want to connect that with what are the technology enablers now become available from the market. Spreadsheets are good and they're traditional, but they work. But to solve more and more complex problems we have today with the challenges, there are more enablers that can help us in, in a better way and in a more efficient way. So for example, there are more technologies in optimization, matter, no matter it's for network, distribution network, or production, there are ongoing involvement for inventory optimization algorithm that can be evolved, especially in solving those multi echelon problems. Transport uh, optimization, more sophisticated interleave routing, and how do we uh, incorporate real-time tra uh, tracking with optimization of the routes? How do we simulate the whole network to create a supply chain digital twin? And all those um, are example of enablers that we can leverage today to solve the challenges we're having. So really the starting point is trying to find a combination between those two. Start with relating what are the challenges that are unique to your organization today that you're constantly seeking answers for. Uh, that, that's a great, great perspective around um, the technology enables FIC. And I think about interleaving and I think about the supply chain digital twin. And sometimes people will need a more of a holistic supply chain digital twin. And other times they won't, right? They'll, they'll have more of a simple, maybe a, just an outbound transportation project where they're not gonna need such a large model. So you, you see this in, in both cases, right? As you work with customers? Yeah, exactly. So that's really important to really understand what's our overall arching. Are we having a bigger challenges that we want to really look at transformation type of um, initiative? or we want to be more agile and start with smaller uh, initiative and then grow even beyond that. Sometimes we'll actually touch later in our webinar, it's better to uh, have an ongoing process to gain trust along the way. That may be some, some specific approach you want to get if getting the initial buy-in is a little bit challenging if you look at a, a boy the ocean type of engagement. Sure, sure. So you've got a lot of great experience, right? And you've, you've come across some challenges 
every project's going to have its challenges, right? And they're going to come up in different areas and we can plan and we can think we know where those challenges are. And I think Vic, you can probably identify that you don't always get it right. Challenges can pop up in, in different areas. And I think you're an expert in, in, in seeing these challenges come up. So I'd love you to walk us kind of, you've, you've done a great job outlining, you know, three main challenges. So why don't you walk us through these challenges and how you've seen these before? Yeah, sure. So also the reason I bring up is if you're starting on the journey for an initiative, it's good to expect what are the potential challenges do you better prepare for it? And we want to share our experience with you on, on that. So I'll start with the unique skill set required. And that's also our theme of today, right? There is a big skill gap in supply chain design nowadays, but why, why the, the gap started? The typical challenge is really for supply chain design, we're looking at a unique combination of different skill sets that traditionally are coming from different talent and different group of people. For example, be technology savvy. So all the optimization, simulation, data skill set come from a technical background but be able to apply those technology into real business require a strong business acumen and supply chain expertise. So supply, supply chain operations background and experience in knowing how daily work is like in a supply chain in a distribution center or in logistics is also demanding in this area. Um, on top of that, a lot of the organization, they perform supply chain design more like an internal consultancy type of um, engagement. In that case, the consulting type of skills and project management skills becomes a, a demanding part as well. So that's, that's one challenge really on the capability of the team members. But at the same time, uh, there's also challenging in engaging and kind of relationship between the member working on the supply chain design as well as the business. So really how we ensure the communication is sufficient so the technology experts know the business realities, know all the nuances, and able to relate technical solution to what's happening in, in the real world in a business. On the other side, the business trust the COE members or, or the, the designers and modelers, right? And, and we're not just designing things on paper and never execute it, never get the trust and buying of it. So that's a um, second area of challenging. Um, topic, which is really the engagement model with the business. Last but not least is really the quality of the results, how we deliver recommendation that's really uh, strong uh, in terms of quality and can be executed, implemented. It's not as simple as you get the output from a model and then analytics and share with the business and they go with it, right? Um, usually in big organizations, we look at design in a horizontal piece, like in kind of integration of different business units, business uh, different regions, then the diversity of the nuances becomes a challenge, right? Uh, also for ongoing practices, do we have standard methods? Do we have, are we applying best practices, knowing the latest trend, not just on technology, but the markets, right? Tr um, supply chain, we work with transportation, we work with the third party logistics, we uh, work with the real-time visibility, all these, are we incorporate them into the solution design to improve the quality? And also when we give the, the recommendation, is it realistic? Is it really solving the problem that's identified at the beginning? And, and that's the reason why we're initiating those design projects, right? It's always good to come back and check if we're answering that. And we see this as a very, Typical challenge we that people and or even ourselves go into analysis paralysis. We get interested and, and embedded in all analytics and forgot to check back if it's really related to uh, the business uh, reality in terms of meaningful analytics. I really like you. You spelled that out. Did I just cut you off there, Victoria? We're going to say something. Uh, no, no, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> I, I love that you talked about trust, and I think that's why we build such a foundation with cross functional team members. Uh, a steering committee, you do not want to surprise an organization with this, right? The more he can do to lay that foundation, build that trust, hold people's hand, because if it's new, there's going to be some fear, right? There's going to be some, some you know, fear and a little uncertainty. So it's really good to um, cover your bases there and really prepare the organization for this. Um, change management, you know, obviously is huge. And analysis paralysis is interesting. And I used to be one of those guys that was trying to get the perfect answer. And what I learned, sometimes an 85% answer is perfect, right? If you're trying to make a decision and you're using some of these modeling tools, um, 
the tickle point between one versus another decision with your model, you, you may have to have an 85% answer and the data supports it. And it's clear that that's the decision to made. So, you know, probably one of the things you deal with is, is, is not having to get everything just perfect, but sometimes really close or good enough is, is good enough. Is that correct? Yep, exactly. Perfect. So let's, this is, this is great, but let's, let's put this in context of a, of a customer, right? And I know Mary, that wasn't here, here with us today, but you were the engagement lead on this. You, you really helped them and partnered with them to deliver on this value. So, you know, Eaton was really looking at how they, you know, they're making the right supply chain decisions. Some of the challenges, you know, they were growing um, through acquisition, um, they had multiple business units across a variety of industry segments, even separate supply chain teams operating with, with different I, IT systems. Um, and they really wanted to get efficiencies, right? When I look at this, it's, it's efficiencies, reduced total, total cost of ownership, and then had some challenges around visibility and analytics for recommending, making those micro and making those recommendations. And I think on this first point, this, this global complex footprint, I don't, you know, there's so much M&A going on, mergers and acquisition. And it, it, when you do an acquisition, you look at that company, you look at the supply chain as part of the due diligence that makes sense. And then you stand back after three or four acquisitions, you've got lots of redundancies in your supply chain, lots of overlapping um, facilities, then you need to right size that and, and, and do your optimization Asian project. Can you give us a little bit more flavor and some of the some more details behind this project, Vic? Yeah. Sure. So, um, Ethan, as you mentioned, uh, Matt, they've been ongoing having uh, acquisition and changes in their footprint and business model. Um, and they're trying to seek a way to solve those questions in a more systematic way, and they can really create synergies and be more and more efficient on the way, on the go, right? So, for example, uh, in the past experiences, they maybe need to answer, look at how to create footprint synergies with a new acquisition, right? How to reduce total cost of ownership for a specific type of product line. And then those projects going on and on. Every year, there are hundreds of projects going on in Eaton. But definitely, when we look at each one of them, the backend method, the data can be shared and can be leveraged. So here's where the initial idea of forming a center of excellence to really develop standard approach, standard um, data templates, um, standard tools to really bring those projects into an integrated way to scale up is where it started. And with that mindset, um, you can actually look at um, different technologies available and how to really uh, approach it and how where to start with the business. And here we, we actually work together with Eaton to identify the roadmap. So really what it started is um, identify, following actually the same methodology you mentioned, uh, Matt, identifying the technology to be used and then start to look at piloting of what project to onboard. It's definitely not a good idea in this situation to start with everything. We want to do one project that to do global supply chain design covering all different product lines. They have spare, spare parts from vehicles, spare parts from airplanes. They have power supply and electrical components, all these. If we want to bring everything together to break down all the walls um, between the systems and operation and have one magic play button, solve everything, that's not um, the, the recommended approach, I would say. So what we work with um, each in this case is really identify the piloting roadmap which organization we should start, what are the problems that's more burning, what are the business units or regions we have the biggest synergies that we can bring value of the center of excellence for design quicker to the business to get their buyings ongoing so we can expand the capability and not burning the whole team and, and really don't have years of cycle time to bring value to implementation. So that was the approach. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And, and getting that quick win is so important for the team members so they have success for the organization that, okay, we brought in some new technology, we formed a team, and we see the value now, right? So you're, again, it's building that trust within an organization, starting small and then getting bigger and bigger. And the nice thing about that approach, the skill sets grow with the team members as well. There's more confidence, there's the, the skills get better, the knowledge that you have transitions to the client over time. So that's, that's a great way to do it is start, start, start a little smaller, you know, get some critical wins and then grow that in, in strategic uh, importance. So we're going to move on to our, our next part of this, which is skills development. And that's just such a 
hot topic right now is, is, and this covers hiring, coaching, training, developing, shadowing. There's a lot of techniques out there. And Victoria and I are going to cover this in, in more detail from my past experience being a practitioner and from Victoria on the consultancy side. So let's bring up poll question number two around skills development. Um, how are you developing the talent you need to achieve your goals? And this one, you can, you can choose many, as many as you want to apply here. So uh, we don't have a plan, just learning as we go. We have a hiring and development plan. Next one, we seek to hire trained talents. We want people that are already trained who know this skill set, um, or we outsource this work as needed. Maybe we do it um, and outsource this and have an external party do this as a managed service. Um, or we embed third-party experts to help fill the gaps and train our internal resources. And I imagine this is, there are quite a few people are going to select more than just one here um, on this. So let's give you a few minutes and then we'll, we'll look at some of these answers and they come in and, and have some dialogue. It's going to be interesting, Victoria, to see this where these come back. And let me let me let me kick it over to you for first first observations, Vic. What do you what do you what do you notice when you look at this? Does this surprise you, or does this this does this about where you thought would come in at? Uh, I wouldn't say it surprised me. It's quite evenly a distributed among the third uh, the the top three items, right? And that's what we saw from our client base as well. Really. Um, based on where they are in the maturity level, we'll talk in a bit, uh, really their strategy of hiring the talent is, is different. Um, I was expecting to see more that in the outsource and, and third-party experts and percentage because our business is in there, right? And then we're seeing a lot of demand uh, for our business, but I then uh, seeing it lower than I expect probably the participants and, and audience here um, are more leaning towards developing capabilities in-house, which uh, it's good because our materials today do cover that. And that, that's the intention of talking about how we can fill the skill gap from organizations yourself. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that, that's spot on. And there's quite a few people, and I just went off the screen, I think it was 20, 24% is they don't have a plan, right? Just learning as we go. And I think there's definitely a lot of, uh, um, a lot of tips you're going to hear today to help you start to formalize that plan. So let's let's talk about skills development, right? Because that gap is both organizational and, and individual. So when you look internally, people with good analytic skills, right? So when I looked for people who could come onto my team, I'd look internally, I'd look externally, and I was looking for people with a problem solving mindset that like to solve problems. I was looking for analytical people and they didn't have to be a, an expert in IT. They didn't have to have a, a programming or coding background. I was looking for my citizen data scientists, right? So I'm preferably a supply chain analyst who's good in spreadsheets, good in Microsoft Excel. And think of all your organizations. You, you have a master of the Excel workbooks that, that do things in your company. Those are great people to look at internally to bring on to a team to do supply chain design because they have a lot of some, some data manipulation skills that can carry over their analytical and they think very precisely when it, when it comes to numbers. And then cross-functional experience. I think this is important. And I, I touched on this before, uh, Vic, as we talked about this, is supply chain design and planning, it's, it's really about cross-functional synergies. It's not looking at just production or just distribution or just um, inbound transportation. And that's where we've been in supply chain for, for years with the SCORE model, right? It's helped optimize silos in our supply chain. And really the, the complete value add of what we're doing here is we're looking across these silos, making a decision that's the best for the company. Um, so it's really helpful to look at people who have experience maybe in more than one area. So they start to think outside their, their just one area of expertise and they start to say, hey, how would this impact other people? So think of that as like systems theory, right? That's even a degree now. You get a degree in systems theory. It's, it's, it's thinking more of that systems instead of one little, one little silo. There's also new graduates. So a lot of companies are snatching up new, new degrees in analytics, um, operations research uh, people, logistics and supply chain folks coming out of college like, like I am now. And there's a lot more coming out now than, than when I came out of college. Um, that's a great place. And these new graduates, they're, they're hungry, right? They've done the case studies in college. They've learned the, the theoretical and they're ready to sink their teeth into something, but they need some, they need some guidance, right? So, you know, one of our customers it does a great job of partnering these very young people out of, out of college, bringing them into a, a center of excellence. 
and then partnering them with someone who's been with the business for 15 or 20 years to give them that business acumen. And that works really well. And then when these, um, when this analyst comes through the, the COE, um, they go on to other areas in the company and they carry that systems thinking with them through all their other positions in supply chain. And that's, that's done them really well and help them create a culture of more holistic decision-making instead of um, siloed decision-making. And obviously there's trainings and certifications that you can utilize, whether it's your solution provider like Coupa um, with our training and that's out there or other providers that are out there. And even your, your consultants like Mebot can do, you know, personalized training for you and help, help with your skill set as well. And then finally, we bring it all together under, under the COE, which, which is a, a center of excellence where we have this technology, we have the people, we have the skill sets, and it really becomes a true center of excellence for uh, supply chain demand and planning. So we have, we've identified technology, uh, we built the steering team, you know, we've determined our first project, um, we got to determine an organizational approach. Now, the gold standard to maximize business value is to develop a center of excellence that I talked about. So let's look at let's look at developing a COE, right? So, so Vic, why don't you walk us through a little more granular detail about what this looks like? Yeah. So um, when we develop a COE, number one challenge or number one requirement is really the member, right? It's all about yeah. people who can support the supply chain design um, activities in the organization. Let's say if we um, got the talent from the market, but it's commonly not the case based on uh, my experience that we'll have one person or, or multiple people team that cover all the required skill set in a COE. Um, I haven't seen that. Um, and if we find anybody, please grab them because they're unicorns nowadays in the supply <laughs> chain world. Now, knowing the reality, we probably find talent from different places. We have college graduates who are, who are eager to learn. We have the who has the technical and academic background. We have people with supply chain um, knowledge and operational experiences, but really a, in a COE environment, it's all about how we bring those knowledge expert, and expertise all together. So we look at things in three main components and the COE member uh, development really need to look at tackling all different pieces. It doesn't need to be one person covering all of them, but as a COE, we need to have a combination of members who are the champions in different areas. So the three different areas we consider as the technical knowledge. So what we mean by technical is really the math, the uh, analytics, and the data expertise in a technical wor world. Um, if you, you have anybody to uh, fill in this, this gap, it's also important that we continue development and enhance and grow maturity level on technology knowledge here. Things change year by year with how uh, technology evolved. Uh, tips and, and tricks that we do five years from now in terms of optimization and data modeling will be outdated, right? It's important to leverage different uh, resources like external training from the, the service providers, uh, have enough internal documentation knowledge transfer between different team members and also leveraging different support um, for any specific modeling techniques can be tools and methods that you leverage to really enhance the technology or technical knowledge. The other aspect we need to continue to grow is really the business um, expertise in supply chain. So how we really develop that because when we look for college graduates, probably that's the, the gap we need to fill that's more, more demanding and more lacking, right? So really give them opportunity to have field expertise, work with different supply chain operations um, and have maybe internal internship period or rotation program to really have exposure to day-to-day -day challenges in supply chain, in production, in, in logistics, in transportation, in planning. Those give them good idea of how to apply the design into real, real problems, have the support from the actual business in each of the engagement that we're working with, have the support from what scenarios from the thought leadership team, what they're thinking to really build on expertise of what are the, the good scenarios to look at. The third component is really the project management and consultancy skills. Again, for any COE members, 
um, they are probably seeing SEMI as uh, internal consultancies to, to our organizations, right? Then the communication skill, the project management, timeline management, and, and really leveraging um, external trainings on sharpen up those skills and be more polished to gain trust from the business is another area we can look at. One thing I want to mention is it may be overwhelming of all the things need to be done to really develop a, a center of excellence and start to drive value, but you don't only have option of starting from scratch and leveraging everything internally. So there are a lot of external support you can get from Krupa, there are the modeling support you can get from consultancies like us, Mibok. We also have all wide spectrum of what you can get to develop your own um, competency based on where you are and, and what's your goal for, for maturity level. So for example, and have your team member to shadowing some projects from external providers like us through um, shadowing, um, coaching, or have uh, external consultants to, leave pro to lead project uh, and develop standard tools, templates, data lake, and also manuals, playbook, or even baseline models for you so that the demand for training and, and competence development is lower, right? Um, or digitize your process. Um, try to alleviate all the data collection and modeling work, but developing maybe apps that the team member can focus more on continuous usage and, and application to business rather than the mathematics and analytics if you are having challenges in terms of budget or finding the right talent. So there's really a mix and match menu available from the market for you to fill in where you have gaps to really finish the whole pile of all areas that you need um, capabilities in. What a great segue into our next slide, just to, you know, take this a little bit deeper with this, you know, a little bit more about, you know, developing these skills and, and career path is important, right? It's for these people, because, it, you know, I wouldn't want to start a company and be just tapped out in my first role. I, I join a COE, I learn these skills. Maybe I want to expand my career outside that COE. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, developing these skills and the career paths you see for supply chain people? Yep. So here we want to look at different um, directions of how people can advance in their career path in the COE. So of course, one direction is really in the roles that you're gaining more and more responsibility, right? We talk about there are uh, three areas of the, the skill set in technical, supply chain, or, or project. It can be somebody become an expert or champion in one of the, the columns or fields and gain more and more responsibility, right? We can have a, a technical uh, expert or subject matter expert for the whole organization. We can have a business owner. If you think about those agile um, components, we can have a business owner as the, the goal for development, or we can have project managers who are responsible of running multiple projects under the COE with different team members, okay? So this is one direction of grow, grow um, growing up, or the other direction is if we want to be a more and more going into that uh, well-combined um, expertise altogether, we can also train technical person with supply chain application with project management skills so they can grow horizontally. And another level to that, it's also possible we've seen from organization is really to grow from a geographical presence point of view. So typical COE may, may start from, from one of the BU or one of the, the region, and then it can be grow into global or more responsibility into multiple supply chain functions. This is where the, the members can grow in terms of presence in the organization as well as responsibilities. So those are the three different uh, dimensions and angles uh, all become feasible uh, to COE members. And what's most important is really communication on those possibilities and have clear um, paths for them to imagine in, and bring the vision to all the members when they start. That, that, that really helps unpack this quite a bit. A, a, a quick question for you. Does a COE member have to be full-time dedicated or do you see some people that are half, you know, part-time in that COE and part-time in a different job? Do you see kind of that job sharing as well? Yeah, I, I, I've seen that. 
and also depends on the scope of the COE and the organization structure, right? For example, we've seen project managers um, share the responsibility of COE projects and other projects. That's very typical, right? And, and we've also seen um, technical experts because a supply chain design work require a lot of data work. So a data center may be a shared responsibility. So really it, it depends on what other uh, requirements are there that's leveraging similar skill set as the COE. Gotcha. So don't, you don't have to think of this as, a, as all or nothing with COE. It's it's quite common to have people that are lending some of their time to the COE, but not all of their time, just depending on the skill sets and and the uh, projects at, at hand. So that's 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 really insightful to understand. And then you know we'd like to bring this down into uh, uh, you know Eaton specific, right? So it's great to talk about the theory and it's great to talk about those things. Um, but can you help us understand really as Eaton went on this path and you encourage them and coach them down it, how this evolved in a real world case? That'd be fantastic for us. Yeah, so Eaton actually they did adopt um, most of the, the techniques or, or directions uh, we mentioned. So if we separate on their approach in two pieces, uh, their ongoing development of their strategy and organization of the COE itself in terms of um, recruiting new members, developing uh, standard practice with a lot of templates, very uh, formalized and, and standard stage gates for, for their project process, um, developing common and shared knowledge of their data platform and incorporate more and more things into the same models. That's one side, they're developing their internal um, COE through all those enablers to develop capability. On the other side, for people and, and members themselves, of course, they, they take the approach to look from the market, but they look both internally and externally because internally uh, members, they can well check two out of the three um, boxes in the pie that we mentioned, right? They have the knowledge, they know the business challenge, they have project management skills, but they're also looking external from, from the market for graduates or other practitioner who has the te technical skill set. And, and a combination of other components and they bring the team together. So they're not having that unicorn approach. They have different team members for different responsibility and have different training plans. So uh, technical trainings, even for the PM, so they can communicate more, more effectively and efficiently. Um, project management trainings to the technicals so they can work more and more seamlessly together. So really the lessons learned from, from Eaton is uh, really, we need a diversity with the team we talked about and develop, develop them, them in a standard but unique way based on the individual profile and also have a problem solve and tool agnostic approach to really build their analytical skills um, and also be able to link analytical skills to business problem to know really what should be optimized, what should be calculated and what should be fixed and, and have sequential approach to bring value to the business. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm just doing a little time check, and I'm looking. We've we've got about less than 20 minutes left, so I'm just going to pick up the pace a little little, little bit because I definitely want to get to some Q and A from the audience. Yeah. So I want to go into this uh, maturity model, which is our our last phase of this. So we're going to look at anchoring within the organization um, and that center of excellence. And the good news is we, we have a maturity model, right? We have a maturity model around the COE, uh, around supply chain design and planning. And you look at these axes, you can take a look at your organization and, and, and don't think you have to be at a certain spot on this, but I think it's good to take an inventory of where you are today. And then you look at your projects and your goals and figure out where you'd like to be in the future. And you can do that, you know, people process technology and strategy, which we're all familiar with. And then from ad hoc and basic all the way to closed loop with, with external collaboration. Um, so I think this is a great roadmap and guide to look at, kind of keep coming back to and checking in is where are we on our maturity model and where do we want to get to? It's, it's nice to start with the end in mind. If you think back to Stephen Covey, think with the end in mind, right? Where are we going and, and how do we get there? Um, and we see, see this as a great guide for companies to, to chart their path, right? Maybe from a process standpoint, someone says, you know, getting over the right, I want some policies with, with dynamic nodes and modes and flows and decision value tracking, um, but I don't have to get all the way to the edge there. So don't look at this as you have to go all the way to the end with, with these. It's really going to depend on your situation. And I think that's where, you know, Coupa and Meebach can help an organization chart their path on this and do that, that gap analysis and then really 
leverage this maturity model is kind of a guiding principle for the for their overall overall COE in itself. So with that being said, let's pop up our third polling question, which is around maturity. So how does your organization approach supply chain design? And here are the, here are the options. We make some ad hoc decisions with Excel. Um, once we see some supply chain challenges, we outsource to a third party uh, vendor every few years. Maybe we do a network design project and we just outsource this every few years. We have some really cool technology someone bought, but I think it's shelfware, but somewhere someone knows something about it and used to use it. Um, we have a cross-functional supply chain team that focuses on CapEx planning that includes, you know, physical supply chain infrastructure, like warehousing, manufacturing plants, and other assets you may have. We're developing a core integrated team, but we're in the early days, or we already have a defined COE. So let's just take a moment here and see where this, this audience is. And based on our last questions, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking, I know where this one's going to end up, Victoria. I, I would make a guess that, um, the COE is going to be. I don't know. I'll probably watch me get this totally wrong right now. Maybe the COE is about, you know, 15% um, uh, outsourcing to third party vendors every few years, maybe 20%. And I, I'm going to stop taking guesses there and we'll, we'll take a look at it. So let's pop that up. I, yeah, see, I was completely wrong. Outsourcing is to, to vendors every few years. I'm glad to see it's not 20%. I'm glad to see it's 11%, especially in the world we live in now because things are changing so quickly. Supply chains really need to be continuously designed. And that's something we talk a lot about at Coupa. I know it's something Meebach talks a lot about is continuously design that supply chain to keep it relevant for your internal and external stakeholders because a supply chain that was designed three years ago, probably not really relevant to, to what's going on right now. So this continuous design is is in crucial. Um, we make some ad hoc decisions with Excel. Sure, once we see things changing, 25%. Uh, we have some cool technology that's shelfware, 9%. And I would, I would, you know, inspire those of you who have who have that technology, start talking to some of your sponsors and, and dust that off and, and bring that into play. There's just untapped value sitting there and, and leverage the value you've made in that, right? In, the, in that agreement, dust off the purchasing agreement, see what you have access to and, and start to bring that to life. It's great to see that that almost a quarter have a cross-functional team that focuses on capex planning. I think there's a, a big focus on that, especially with channel shift and and growth of a lot of the consumer brands. Um, you really, you really need to have that capex planning there, looking out multiple years to say when are we going to need new warehousing space, when we're going to need manufacturing space or outsourcing partners, um, and then developing that core team. But in the early early days, you know that's fantastic. And I think the pandemic has really brought a renewed focus on hey, we need to be sustainable. And we talk a lot about sustainability um, in corporate you know terms in general. But really, sustainability and supply chain, supply chain design, and make this you know a function of the company, and then finally eleven percent at that uh, at that COE. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to just push on a little bit to our next slide, and let's take a look at if it pushes on for me. So let's take a look at you know how a CEO is set up upped in three dimensions. So can you quickly just Victoria give us a just give us walk us through these three uh, briefly if you would. Yeah, one, one side you already mentioned in um, maturity level model is really the technology um, aspect, right? What we want to also kind of broaden uh, your mind here is that's not the only way that you evolve your COE and, and further develop it. There are other angles and other dimensions you can grow into, especially for the ones that, that I saw in the responses that you have shelfware or you have ad hoc, and this is not really a continuous um, progress you have. But supply chain is ever changing today. And then if you have technologies, may as well leverage it and build your, your continuous usage of it. You don't need to go very fancy like AI and everything. That's not the purpose. There are other where you can in, expand your influencing supply chain. For example, expand to more functions. One technology that's applied in your distribution network, think about applying to your production planning, your product allocation within a, within a site and things like that. There are more and more areas in supply chain you can really extrapolate and, um, and really permutate the use cases you have with the same type of technology with limited or, or reduced effort on training and, and capability development. The other side is go down in the planning level. You do ad hoc every couple of years, but the same technology can also help a lot of questions you have on the planning level. When you're doing as an OP, leveraging um, similar optimization models to fill in your gap in your planning cycles 
again, with reduced and limited effort to invest further, but this can be ongoing involvement of your COE in different directions. Perfect. So let's let's take this into a, a specific example again, and bring this back to Eaton. Help us understand how they how they really did supply chain optimization projects to to drive the value that they got. Yeah, quickly for for Eaton, they started with very traditional distribution network optimization, right? And then over the course of two years, it was expanding to uh, multiple directions already. So more advanced technology or expanding of te technology base into inventory optimization and route optimization. They also expanded into more functional areas to do production optimization for, for new product and also uh, leveraging existing footprint for production planning on strategic level. And also um, they looked into digitalization as both the technology and also bring the model down to a planning level by developing digital twins as well as inventory management app in, with the back end of the inventory optimization um, model model. So really, um, they're, they're taking the traditional approach we, we talk about, starting with what we're most familiar with, where the best opportunities are, where we have the best success to get buy-ins, and then quickly it was extrapolated to the multiple directions with growth, both in technology, process, level of influences, um, planning level, as well as more and more functions in supply chain. That's great. You know, inventory stands out to me because, you know, many years ago, it was almost a three letter word. You know, we have too much reduce working capital, reduce, reduce, reduce. And it's one, become one of the strategic things to help buffer uncertainty, which is one of the few purposes of inventory buffer uncertainty and obviously production lot sizes. But but it's it's so important to get those inventory levels right. And while ERP systems do a great job of, you know, holding a value, getting above that with these planning tools and saying, what should our inventory be? And how do we balance um, in working capital investment with fill rates, right? There's a direct link between uncertainty of demands coming in, uncertainty of supply, where to position that inventory. So it's great to see inventory really popping up in strategic value. I see that more and more and more as a, as a, as a common theme fix. I'm glad, I'm glad Eaton is, is looking at inventory and especially that multi-echelon part. So if you've got a um, you're vertically integrated. It's where do you, what, where do you even store those materials and what stage, whether it's intermediate or finished goods. So there's a lot of levers we can turn here. So inventory is becoming cool again, right? It's not the uh, three letter word that it used, used to be uh, so long ago. So we're, we're almost wrapped up and just a couple, couple slides here left. One lessons learned, right? Um, so talk to us about the lessons learned. I love this concept of anchoring the organization as well. Uh, unpack anchoring the organization for it, for us, will you? Yeah, so one challenge that, that we did mention is really how we um, get trust and how we actually have ongoing initiative in the COE and that become part of your business process, right? It's not a, a shelf, shelfware or shelf organization that is fully um, kind of disaggregated with the rest of the organization to really build and grow your influences. There are some lessons learned we, we want to share how to really have an ongoing vision and importance growing. Make sure you connect to the business. Make sure you learn and establish the, pro the, the trust across the company and deliver value. So make sure the result you give, it goes to um, a approval from the business and they are actually being executed, um, uh, preferably being executed. You have quick wings. Don't try to bore the ocean and do analysis paralysis that's seen as investment, but bring value quicker. Also, make sure there are change management around uh, your total cost of ownership and network design optimization. That's from Eaton. That's embedded in your core pro process. So when you do your strategic plan, annual plan, or even more uh, tactical planning, they consult the COE as a long-term process. So really, it's part of the business process. I think that last one's really important, a very, very, very valid point. So why don't, why don't we just look at the summary of this? So in summary, you've got like about four points here. So why don't you, why don't you summarize this for us and we'll see if we have a time for at least one or two questions. Okay, I will go really quick. Okay. Some key points we want, we want you as the audience to take away. One, remember to, for COE, you really need to cut across different business. This is where supply chain is complex, this is where benefits and synergies are. And also make sure your COE member um, are, are shared of common resources. Uh, don't try to have one unicorn fit everything you need. Try to fill in your skill gap uh, with a profile of different members. They don't need to be dedicated. 
and also have champions and subject matter experts for different components and areas you identify as the capability requirements and make sure they own it. Last but not least, grow in your business influences, anchor your organization, um, anchor your COE in your organization. So if you remember those four points, then we're successful here. So if you missed everything else, you fell asleep, mm -hmm. this is, these are your four takeaway points to, to take back to your organization to, to get some further momentum or, or start the momentum. Thank, thanks so much, Victoria. And let me ask the moderators, do we have time for a question or two before we wrap up today? And if we do, would you go ahead and read us uh, one? And Well, and uh, we are tight on time, Matt, but maybe we can squeeze in just a couple of quick ones. And this would be for Victoria. I know this question might require a long answer, but let's try to keep it as short as possible. Where did you begin and why? Oh, that, that requires a long, yeah. uh, <laughs> long answer. Um, to cut it short, where do you begin? Um, start to look at, again, business challenges you have. If you are a global um, role, look at individual in operations, what's happening. If you're a representative business unit with operational role, talk to um, the directors, talking to the, the VPs and the sponsors to understand where they seeing as the shortfalls you have and try to link that with enablers and technologies. That's where you can have the first start. Okay, thank you for that. And finally, I think we'd only have time for maybe one more question. That is, what are the first, this is sort of related to what you were saying, maybe you could extemporize on that, but what are the first steps to putting together a business case for implementing a center of excellence? How do you sell it? So, Again, that's a, another long answer. I'll use Ethan as one example of how, how it was performed. Uh, once you have initial idea of what technology you want to use, following what uh, Matt recommended, identifying the type of problems you can solve with this technology and put maybe cost of goods and total spend in those of areas that you have problems, put your investment of um, the technology, the software, headcount you need to solve those problems, Again, external help can be leveraged, like um, consultants can give you good estimation of what's the effort for, for time and project and resources and put those together. Don't, you don't need to always think about, you need to put all the investment at the beginning to build a fully extensive team. That's your SWOT. Try to think about leveraging helps from the service providers, from consultants to train your resource. So it's not always either or, or. It can be a combination for your maturity and the roadmap to leverage external costs instead of uh, investments. And, okay. and Bob, one, one go ahead, Matt, real quick. This. It's all about return on investment, right? And one, one thing yeah. we didn't cover, we survey our customers, right? We've surveyed over 600 customers in the last few years. And well, results may vary, right? We, we, we know that. Um, on average, across the pillars, they, they design a project around whether it's manufacturing, whether it's around distribution, um, inventory, we see about an average nine to 10% cost reduction in those areas. So that it's all about return on investment and selling that value to your, you know, your CFO or your executive team saying, here's the investment. And, and you just imagine if you can cut 10% out of your working capital and increase fill rates, if you can cut 10% out of your manufacturing costs, I mean, we're talking millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, depending on the company, all going back to that $16 billion in value. That's where we got that from. That's from our customers. So huge ROI here, leverage that ROI for sure. Fantastic yep. opportunity. Yeah, uh, I'm sad. Uh, sadly, we are out of time. I'm sure that our speakers would be only too happy to answer any audience questions that we didn't get to offline. But in the meantime, I want to thank Matt Tishon and Victoria Ma, Koopa and Meebach, respectively, for this great presentation. Here's some contact information for you right there to reach each of those two excellent companies. Audience members also, thank you so much for listening in and for participating. So uh, to everybody then, have a great day. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you.